All right, good morning, everyone. It is uh, an incredible schos to be able to continue in Safer Tehillim together with all of you. So with your permission, or even without your permission, I'd like to spend one more week in Mirat Hashem on Kapitel Samech Zayin. So the truth is, you'll see, the reason I'd like to do this is because, to me, there's always an interesting confluence of events. In other words, we, I often find this in, uh, in our Dafyomi Shir, how it's incredible that over the course of a seven and a half year cycle, you could have a Gemara that links in to what's happening contemporarily. Either there's a reference to an upcoming Yom Tiv, or there's some type of reference to something that's happening in the greater world, greater society. Often when that occurs, it's almost like a sign from the Ribbon Shalom. Rakadosh Baruch Hu tells us, thank you so much for learning my Torah Shayim. Thank you so much for, living my, for learning my living Torah, which is a living, breathing organism we don't just learn you know historical ancient information yes we take an ancient historical text be it chumish be it navi be it gimara but we extract the contemporary meaning out of it in in ways that guides our contemporary lives so for full disclosure i was ready to begin capital samach zayin i wanted to begin chapter 68 this week but then it struck me that there is a potential incredible tie-in between this capital and Parsha Zacher. The upcoming, right, this upcoming Shabbos, we have the obligation to go ahead and read Parsha Zacher. We have a, interesting, we're not getting into all the halachic technicalities. So amazingly enough, we know normally Kriya Sator, the obligation to read the Torah, Mondays, Thursdays, Shabbos, Shabbos by Mincha, is a rabbinic obligation. There is one time throughout the year where there is a biblical obligation to hear a Kriya, and that's Parsha Zacher. We have a biblical obligation to remember that which Amalek did to us, which we'll discuss in just a little bit. But I thought that there's a really dramatic tie-in to this particular capital. So if you take a look at number in number one, we're actually, I'm doing something I've never done before. Not only are we staying in the same capital, but in fact, we're actually going to stay in the same exact Pasuk. So I feel like we're mamish like, but we're moving forward. You'll see we're developing a new dynamic with it. So again, remember, we know already we're, we're, we're experts. This is our third shear in this particular chapter, so we're already well versed with the concept, with the context of capital Samech Zayin. It's in this capital, according to most opinions, again, So we, we went through this capital last week, we saw the al Sheikh in number two, and the al Sheikh said, Hine Mizmor Zeh, so remember again, the context of this particular capital is David HaMelech is referencing the Messianic era. And the hallmark of the Messianic era is that the nations of the world, not just Klal Yisrael, but everyone will know of the greatness of the Ribbon Shalom. That is the hallmark of the Messianic era. We're going to focus again on Pasuk Gimel. So what did we say in Pasuk Gimel? Ladas ba'aretz darkecha. Literally translated, that your way should be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. And it struck me, it struck me that, so remember, we spoke about this last week. What does it mean? So remember again, we saw the Piazetzna. I'm not going to give a whole review of the Shira because it's going to end up being the whole Shira again. Hey, so again, we spoke about what does it mean? Ladas ba'aretz. Okay. But what, what struck me is the use of the word ladas. We focused on this a little bit last week also. Atachonin la adam das. We spoke about this. But ladas ba'aretz darkecha. That what does it mean? Just a little translation. That your way should be known on the earth. And the al Sheikh writes over here in number three. Ladas ba'aretz darkecha. Ki ad ko einenu noda. David HaMelech is highlighting something very interesting. That what's going to be the hallmark of the Messianic era? Ladas ba'aretz darkecha. Your way, your being HaKadosh Baruch Hu, your way will be known on the earth. Now what could we infer from that, says the al that prior to Messianic redemption, prior to Yimosa Mashiach, ki ad ko, until Mashiach, einenu noda. The ways of Hashem are not known. So that is a very dramatic statement because what David HaMelech is clearly highlighting is the idea, and I think we referenced this a little bit last week as well, this idea that the hallmark of the Messianic era is clarity. Is clarity, right? What do we struggle with most? If you ask people, what do you struggle with most in life? So the truth is you'll get the classic answers, right? Uh, health, parnasa, shalom bias, 
children, either having them at first, or again, raising them then for the rest of your lives, whatever, you, you get the classic answers. But I think if we kind of zoom out a little bit and look at the more panoramic nature of the human condition, I think that the greatest struggle we really end up contending with is clarity. Is clarity, finding a sense of life clarity. On a, just a basic level, sometimes it's finding clarity in what's right, what's wrong. Now, sometimes it's obvious. Obviously, I know something is kosher, something is treif. That's a little bit easier. I'm not talking about what happens in your kitchen. I'm talking about the more complicated place, what happens in your heart. Sometimes I want to make decisions, and I don't know, like, what's the right path, what's not the right path. You know, I'll just give you a simple example of this. A person runs into, is doing something in life, is undertaking a particular initiative or endeavor, and I hit a brick wall. I hit a brick wall. So if I were to ask you, if I were to ask you, what, what's the message from the Ribbono Shalolam when you hit a brick wall in life? What's the message? I want to tell you, it's times like this that I, I miss our live sheer very much. Because if I would have thrown out a question like this, there would have been a, a dim and talking and this. Talking would have usually even gone on after I moved on with this year. It's a different discussion. But, you know, that's, it's beautiful to know with everybody online. But the, the, the true excitement of Toda sometimes is not fully captured on Zoom. But hopefully you could mumble to yourself a little bit. So right? what does it mean when I hit a brick wall in life? And doesn't this happen all the time? I'm working on something. Either I'm working on something myself, on my personal self, or I'm working on a project for the community, for my family, and I... What does that mean? Well, there are two possibilities. Possibility one is sometimes when you hit a brick wall, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling you, wrong direction. Wrong direction. You're going down the wrong path. And sometimes the brick wall means try harder. How do you know? So how do you know when the brick wall means wrong direction, try a, diff try, try a different way, try a different mahalach, a different approach. And when does the brick wall mean, no, 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 you're on the right path, you just have to try harder. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> the answer is, th th this is th this is the lack of clarity. We run and by the way, this happens every day because good things in life never materialize, right? Good things in life never just simply appear. So how do you know when struggle means you're going down the wrong path and when struggle means you're going down the right path who just wants you to work harder? We don't know. That, that, that's, that's I, I can't tell you, not a day goes by that somebody doesn't come to me with this type of life question. And I, 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 it's the same answer all the time. It's a great question. It appears that what you're trying to do is really beautiful, significant, and incredibly meaningful. I wish I was a Navi. I wish I was a Navi. I'd have so many more answers and be a lot more popular. I don't actually I know about that. The Navim weren't generally very popular. But, it, but that's the clarity. So David HaMelech says, La das bar tarkecha. Do you know what the hallmark of the Messianic era is? Clarity. Can you imagine waking up in the morning and knowing exactly what you need to do? I don't mean your task list of I have to go here, I have to do this, my appointment. That's not what I mean. I mean on a life level, here's what I need to do. Here's what I need to accomplish. Here's what I need to be. Ah, I'd run up against resistance. Oh, the resistance means this. The resistance means wrong way. The resistance means try harder. That's the Messianic era. La das ba'aretz darkecho. So of course, David HaMelech over here is specifically talking about clarity as it relates to the Ribbono Shalom. That in this pre-Messianic world, I don't know how HaKadosh Baruch Hu works. I don't know. I, I don't understand how he operates. I don't understand why he does some of the things that he does. There's just so many things that escape my comprehension. In the Messianic era, la das ba'aretz darkecho. I will know. And it struck me it struck me that this, this word yediyah, this word yada, is a very powerful world, powerful, powerful word. What's the first time we ever find the word yada? The first time, va adam yada es chava ishto. Adam knew his wife chava. Now, of course, in, in Tanakh, yada is a euphemism for, for relations, for intimate relations. But why does the Torah Dafka use that word? There are so many other words you could use for relations than yada. Because what the Torah is trying to convey to us is for Adam and Chava, 
it wasn't simply a physical union. There was a deeper spiritual connection. Again, th that's of course in general what intimacy is supposed to be, is not just a physical act, but a deeper emotional connection. But Adam Yada Eschave Ishto. So it struck me that Tavara Nalech says, Ladas Ba'aretz Darkecha. That there are things in life that we're supposed to, I'll, I'll give you an example. We all know there are certain things that you have to know. Certain things you have to know. And other things that it's nice to know, but you don't have to know. You have to know when your loved one's birthdays are. You have to know. Baruch Hashem. Now for, for digital calendars on your cell phone, you could plug in a reminder for the next 27 years, which is great. Baruch Hashem. For some of us, that's a lifesaver, right? If a person has a schos to be married, you have to know your anniversary. Lahavdil, you have to know a yard site, right? You have to know your birthday. You have to know your weekend. There are certain things you have to know. Other things... It's fine if you do know it, fine if you don't know it, but it doesn't move the needle on, on your own personalistic growth or accomplishment. David HaMelech says, La das, la das doesn't just mean to know. La das means to know something in your core. La das means to know something in a most intimate way. You see, I'm supposed to know HaKadosh Baruch Hu. V'yadatas Hashem Elokecha. That's why the Torah says, interestingly enough, the Torah uses the same words in a relationship between man and God as it does between husband and wife. Two words, Yediyah, and also the other word is Davak. Al of ish es ave v'imo v'davak b'ishto. Person will leave his mother and father and he will cling to his wife. The only other time we find that word, v'davak do b'ashem, v'davak do by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So it's fascinating. The same words used to describe the intimacy of a husband-wife relationship are the same words used to describe the relationship between man and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This is not a surprise, because remember, all of Shira Shirim is this, right? All of Shira Shirim is the metaphor of a love between a man and a woman, which represents the love between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Klal Yisrael, that intense, passionate, intimate, intertwined love. HaKadosh, this is incredibly important. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want to be my friend. He doesn't want to be my friend. He wants me to be in love with him. That's what he wants. You know, our greatest, sometimes our greatest challenge in Ruchnius, if we're honest with ourselves, the greatest challenge is I say to God, Hashem, I love you. But I think we should see other people. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I'm ready to settle down yet. You know, I love you. Don't, don't get me wrong. You're great. It's not you. It's me. It's me. I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, you know, about what's going on. We, we often want to keep it platonic with God. And HaKadosh Baruch who's sitting on the other side of this relationship table and he says, I I'm all in. I love you. I can't stop thinking about you. You're, you're everything to me. And we're all for the ones saying, Baruch Hu, yeah, it's great. It's great. You know what? Let's go through the Shadchan. You know, I, I don't know if we're necessarily up to the point where we could, you know, talk to each other yet. Let's go through the Shadchan, you know, and, and let's see where it goes. Let's give it time. I don't, I don't like to rush into anything. And it's such an irony. Because the King of Kings is ready to have an all-in, passionate relationship with me, and I have commitment issues. That's what it comes down to. I have commitment issues. That's it. That is the sum total of my Ruchnius challenges. Because if I had the courage to say, I'm in, I'm yours, then the relationship flourishes. So it's incredible that what I want in this world is a idea. What I want in this world is to know Hashem, but not to know Hashem as a friend. To know Hashem, va'adam yada eschava ishto, spiritual intimacy. I want to be intertwined with the Ribbono Shalom. Yet amazingly enough, David HaMelech says, it could be that while it's possible to attain that in this world, and there are definitely those who do, and that has to be our mission, that really is the hallmark of the Messianic era. La das ba'aretz darkecha. That yediyah, that yediyah, that spiritual intimacy, that intertwinedness with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that oneness, the vidavak tabo, viadato as Hashem, perhaps that's the hallmark of the Messianic era. And then it got me thinking a little bit about other things that we are obligated to know. 
Because remember, as I mentioned before, there are two different categories of what we'll call the things you have to know. Things you have to know because it's nice to know them. And things you have to know because if you don't know them, you are stunted as an individual. And it struck me that we have such an example of this, as I mentioned before, this week in Parsha Zohar. If you take a look at number four on your sheet, so we're going to read this in Yerat Hashem this coming Shabbos, this coming Shabbos, the Pasuk says, Zohar is asher asalacha amalik bederach betzeischem in Mitzrayim. Remember what Amalek did to you when you left Egypt. Asher karacha baderach vayizanei v'cha kam nechashal macharacha. They attacked you a little. They happened upon you on the way. The stragglers behind you. Va'ata ayef v'yagea. And you were tired. You were tired. V'lo yarei alokim. And did not fear God. It's interesting discussion on the Mepharshim. Who, who is that referring to? Who didn't fear God? We, Klal Yisrael, didn't fear God? Or Amalek didn't fear God? Okay, that's a discussion. And it will be when Hashem will go ahead and give you, literally deliver your enemies into your hands and He'll give you Eretz Yisrael. So He'll give you a portion and inheritance. Wipe out Amalek. Wipe out Amalek, literally eradicate the memory of Amalek from underneath the heavens. Do not forget. Do not forget. So we are familiar with this. This is the biblical mitzvah we have in Mir Hashem this, this Shabbos. This Shabbos. And again, this is not the halacha shit, but I would urge you, and especially in a pandemic, people have different levels of comfort, you know, speak with your Rab about there are other ways to be Yotze Parsha Zachar as well if a person doesn't feel comfortable coming to Shul. So make sure, you know, you can ask that Shaila and your Rab will give you guidance. But what I want to share with you is something amazing. There is a there is a six volume set of Svarim called Shaila Suchuvas Mima Amakim, which literally translated means responsa from the depths. Written by Rav Ephraim Ashri, Zecher Tzadik Vekadosh Livracha. Rav Ashri was a Rav, was a Rav in the in the, in the Kavna ghetto, and interestingly enough, Rav Ashri like, a very a very similar narrative to the Piagetsna, that that ultimately again Rav Ashri did not apply for this position of Rav of the Kavna ghetto. After Rav Elchanan Wasserman and Hashem Yikom Damo was murdered by the Nazis, Machshon Vazikram, together with their Lithuanian collaborators in the Ninth Fort, Rav Ashri became, he became the Rav. He became the Rav. He was the person who was there to go ahead and answer all of the Shilas. And Rav Ashri decided that he was going to record these questions and answers. Why? Because Rav Ashri didn't know if he was going to survive the war. But he felt that it was necessary to preserve these Shailas Achuvas as a sign of the spiritual heroism of the Jewish people. That people were asking Shailas, that people were concerned with Halacha, that people wanted to know what is the Ratzon Hashem, what is the Ratzon Chazal in the midst of overwhelming circumstances. And Rav Ashri recorded everything. Rav Ashri recorded everything. And the truth is, when you read them, they are absolutely dramatically overwhelming. Now, Ravashi did something very interesting. During the war, when he answered these Shailas, he had no Svarim. See, he's a brilliant, he was a brilliant Talmud Chacham. He had no Svarim. He answered all of them, you know, pretty much based on memory. But he promised that if he would survive the war, he would go back and put in the sources and develop on the answers a little bit. So amazingly enough, he, Baruch Hashem of Ashri survived the war. The story of his survival is actually quite amazing as well. He actually saved also one of the Sifre Torah from the Kav Nogeto by taking it off the Atzechaim, taking it off the poles and wrapping it around his body. Um, he was an incredible individual. So after the war, he, he, he went back and he published these chuvas. He published the Tshuvas, again, a six-volume series, Shailas Tshuvas Mima Amakim. There is an English volume that is called Responsa from the Holocaust. Um, and I, I happen to think it, it's, it's required reading. It's required reading for two purposes. Number one, to see that the Torah we have addresses literally every single circumstance in life, from the most beautiful and wonderful to the most horrific, but also to see the spiritual heroism of Jews and to understand you know I just want to mention this for just a moment we don't really know anymore what Mesiras Nefesh means we, we just we don't have 
we don't, we, Baruch Hashem, we live in a time we don't have to have the Mesiras Nefesh, right? For, for a lot of times, our Mesiras Nefesh comes in the form of finances because to be a from Jew is very expensive. Or for some, Mesiras Nefesh comes if you can't get, you know, your kosher, the Pesach bagels, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. People have different levels of Mesiras Nefesh. But you, you could see what Mesiras Nefesh was. And by the way, it's le, le, less than a century ago. Less than a century ago, what actual Mesiras Nefesh, what it means to live and die as a Jew and be preoccupied and concerned with your Yiddishkeit, with your Neshama, with Torah Mitzvahs, with Shulchan Aruch, until you breathe your last breath. It, it, it's absolutely incredible. So I'll tell you, I, I did, I, for, for many years I didn't, when I, when I, before we came to Baltimore, so one time I was talking about Rav Ashri and so I was giving a shir somewhere, and there was a person in the shir who happened to have a personal connection. He was still alive at the time. It was about 20 years ago. And he said, do you want to meet Rav Ashri? So I said, of course, I'd love to meet Rav Ashri. So he took me to the Lower East Side. Rav Ashri was a rav on the Lower East Side, of based Medrash HaGadol. He took me to meet Rav Ashri. So you know in your mind, sometimes you have an image of someone. You have an image of what they're going to look like. So I imagine Rav Ashri was this man who, you know, he carried Klal Yisrael on his shoulders in the, one, the darkest chapter of Jewish history. I just had this image of a tall, strapping, broad man with a deep voice. Rav Ashri opened the door. And literally when he opened the door, I didn't see him. He was so short. I, I don't think he was even, I don't think he was five feet. I, I don't think he was five feet. A tiny little man. Mama, a tiny little, obviously by then he was also already an older man. And I, I could not believe it. It was amazing to me that someone so physically small could be such a spiritual giant. So one time I was actually giving a shear in here in Baltimore, and she, one, I don't remember, one Shabbos, maybe, and I mentioned Shal Sachuvis Mi Mama Akim. So I I um so I lamented the fact all I had at that time was the English version. The English version of, of of responsa from the Holocaust because they stopped printing the Hebrew version of Shalz Chuvas Mimamakim. Why? I, I don't know. And actually, in, in one of the women there is Mrs. Esther Kayla Fleischman. She heard that I wanted the, the set. I don't know. Maybe she has a family member who deals in rare svarim. So, to make a very long story short, that week I had all six volumes of Shalz Chuvas Mimamakim, but it gets better. It was inscribed by Rav Ashri. Now, what does this mean? Not to me. Rav Ashri already passed away. He had given it as a bar mitzvah gift to someone. And I guess whoever he gave it to didn't want it anymore. So I had like, Labachar Hanechmad. I said, I just wish it said Shmuel. Then it would have been perfect. But okay, it, it didn't. It didn't. But I will tell you, those, those Svarim are, are one of my greatest treasures in my, in my library. Just because, to me, they rep it, 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 those Svarim represent the Kiddush of Klal Yisrael. If, if you want to know, to me, if you want to know who Klal Yisrael is, to Svarim. Ish Kodesh, the Piazetzna, like we saw last week, and Shalas HaTshuvah Smi Ma'amakim, the Tshuvah of Rav Ashri, and if you want to see why we are here, and if you want to see why we thrive, and if you want to see why we are the chosen people, read those Svarim. Of course, Chumash is good also, but I'm just saying, if you want to understand the Nitzchiyas of Klal Yisrael, you look at that. So Rav Ashri has an introduction. His introduction in the third chilek, in the third chilek, which I put on your sheet. Now, I put a lot more here than what we're going to do. We're not going to do this entire thing. We'll actually do most of it, most of it outside. But I put it here because if you happen to have some free time and you want to learn through this, it is a powerful, powerful cathartic piece. So Ashi writes as follows. Source number five. Peparsha Zachar Neymar. Zachar is Asher Asalach Amalek. So Rav Ashri points out, the Torah commands us when it comes to Amalek, two commandments. Commandment number one, commandment number one, ultimately again is remember what Amalek did to you. And commandment number two is don't forget. And Rav Ashri asks an obvious question. What's the obvious question? If the Torah tells me to remember, obviously by definition, remembering means what? Means what? Don't forget. So why does the Torah Akidosha have, remember there are no extra words in the Torah. So if you're telling me, remember what Amalek did to you, I understand of course that means don't forget what Amalek did to you. So why do you have to spell it out? Why does it have to say Zachar remember and Lo Tishkach don't forget? So if you look in the left hand paragraph in number five, and here you have to understand something. When we speak about Amalek, we speak about Amalek in an esoteric idea. 
We speak like, right? There's Amalek. And when we think about Amalek, who do you think about? You think about, like the Torah says, oh, they, oh Amalek, they attacked us when they came out, when, they, when we came out of Mitzrayim. For of Ashri, Amalek was not an esoteric concept. And for of Ashri, Amalek was not a nation who had attacked us thousands of years before. For of Ashri and his fellow survivors, Amalek were the people they saw just a few months ago. Amalek were the people who they were liberated from just a little while ago. Amalek were the ones who they saw murder children and parents, young, old, everyone. So Amalek, so, so when Rav Ashri looked at these psukim, this wasn't some historical event that happened that we can't forget. This was now. This was now. This was his life. These are the images that I guarantee you swirled around his head whenever he closed his eyes. So if you look in the left-hand paragraph, Rav Ashri says something amazing. He says, So says of Ashri, do we need HaKadosh Baruch Hu to remind us, to remember Amalek? Of course we're going to remember. And look how he takes a biblical mitzvah and weaves it into their contemporary experience. How says Rav Ashri, can we not remember those days? Those days, Yomim shal ima upachat shal heragushmat. How could we not remember these days of fear, of murder, of destruction? Yomim shal machanos hesger umachlos ghetto. How could we not remember the concentration camps and the ghettos? Yomim shal kivshanish. How do we not remember the ovens? Shal herek hamoni b'mukhunos yiriya b'kfuros chaim shal afi alafim nehabim uniimim shebechayim mosam lo nifredu. How can we forget the open mass graves? How can we forget the beautiful neshamas that were murdered right in front of us? How could we not remember the camps of destruction? Auschwitz, Treblinka, Majdanek, Hamivtratashi, the ninth fort, which was right outside the Kovna ghetto. Ayde Kovno, Sheshama, Hutzularog, Panayar, Babiyar, Old Kehino, Kehino, Shagarmanin, Yimachshon, Vizirchem, Hikimu, Bechal, Artsos, Europa, Behem Nisrafu, Nergu, Nechnuku, Achinu, Vachi, Yosinak, Yoshim, Hashemi, Kom Damam. So Rav Ashri says, tell me, and, and, and you have to understand almost, you, you, you hear him almost speaking to the Rebbein Shalom, Rebbein Shalom, tell me, and if you wouldn't have told me to remember, and if there wouldn't have been a Tzivui, you think I wouldn't remember? How could I not remember that which occurred to my beloved Mishpacha? How could I not remember that which occurred to my beloved people when the fires, the embers were still burning? If you go to the next page, what I did over here, just so you see, I put the, the letters in the middle, so either will be on the right of Aleph or the left of Aleph. So right now we're on the right right side of the letter Aleph. Betuchi ya Torah. So Vashri says something amazing. He says, the Kaddish Baruch Hu knows, Betuchi ya Torah, Sheniskar, Eis asher asalach amalek, Ki chok tivai hu adavar, Ki eich efshar shelo liskar, Es kol imas azava shechaya hagemanes ases salonu. So, the Torah knows we're going to remember because people don't forget traumatic experiences. People never forget traumatic experiences. So of course I'm going to, of course I'm going to remember the trauma. And remember again, this is why I keep saying the, the, the power of this piece is Rav Ashri is not looking at the mitzvah of remembering Amalek through the prism of a historical event. He, he had the scars of Amalek still on him. So of course I'm going to remember. Of course I'm going to remember. But in addition to remembering, the Torah tells me another obligation. And what's the other obligation? He goes on, he says, he says, uh, I'm sorry. So listen to this. So before we tie this in, Ravashi says as follows, if you look at the Psukim of Amalek, so for example, if you just go back for a second, just to number four, you'll see something fascinating. The Torah says, remember what Amalek did to you when you left Egypt, okay? They, they, they happened upon you, they attacked the stragglers. And then in number four, Pasuk 19, verse 19, the Pasuk says, It'll be when the Lord your God grants you respite from all your enemies around you, in the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance to possess. So Ashri says something amazing. Hashem tells us in this Pasuk something dramatic, which is, 
Amalek is going to hurt you, and Amalek is going to kill you, and Amalek will try to decimate you, but at the end of the day, you will rebuild. You will come to Eretz Yisrael, you'll come to your land, and you will rebuild your life. In other words, embedded in this Pasuk of remembering that which Amalek did to us is also, V'haya Baniya Hashem Elokech. Hashem will bring you to your land. Rav Ashri writes, he says, I'm in right hand paragraph Aleph, the right of the right hand paragraph Aleph, about five lines in. He says, Hatori Odas, Kilachar Shashem Yaniachlanu. Life is gonna, we'll get back on the rails. All of the sparks, save all the survivors. Baruch Hu knew the survivors. We will rebuild our lives. Ultimately, again, they will build new homes. They will build new families. They'll start businesses and they'll be successful. They will begin to see success. And the lands which they came to as refugees, they will see incredible success. And not only, not only will they go ahead and be sustained, but they will be wildly successful. So I just want to point out how prophetic these words, right? Ravashi wrote this in the early 1950s. So I just want to point out if you think about, if you think about this for just a moment, right? We, even though we are in the diaspora, most of us, Baruch Hashem, there's some Arabs and Israel here joining us as well, right? Even though we're in the diaspora, we are living in a golden age of Jewry. Think about this for just a moment. You know, Baltimore is not a good example because the truth is, Baltimore is one of those communities where people have been in this country for generations, which was interesting when I came to Baltimore. You know, I often say, like, my mother was born in the DP camps after the war. And growing up in New York, New Jersey, that was very common that people my age, I'm not an old man, but were first generation Americans or most second generation Americans. Baltimore is unique in that you have multiple generations who have been here. But if you think about this for just a moment, people came here as refugees. People came here as refugees. And within two generations, the unprecedented amount of wealth in the Jewish community is overwhelming. Is overwhelming. It's, it's overwhelming. And, and I just want to point out, in the 1950s, no one would have ever said this. No one would have ever said this. No one predicted anything. But you look at people like Rav Aaron Kotler. You look at people like the Baba Vareba. Right? The Baba Vareba lost everything. People think the Baba Vareba, they think about Hasidus. What the Baba Vareba did for, for Yiddishkeit in this country is absolutely overwhelming. He lost everything. He lost 10 children and a wife. He lost everything and he came here and rebuilt. And what about the survivors who came here with nothing and became captains of industry? We see, Ravashi wrote this in the 1950s, but we see it now. We see it today. We don't think about this. We, for, we, organized religion as we have it today is not more than two generations old in America, if you think about it. Re, I mean, the, the, the real robust nature of it. And look what it's become. Look what it's become. So Vashri says, V'haya baniach, the Pasuk already tells us, yes, Amalek is going to hurt you, and Amalek will try to destroy you, but you'll rebound. You'll rebuild your families, you'll rebuild your homes, you'll rebuild industry, you'll rebuild your wealth, you'll have everything. So look what happens. Now go to paragraph Bays, the right hand of the paragraph Bays. As, Yodaz HaTorah, Sha'udim HaMutsalim Halolu Sri De'aish, Yis'amtsu B'chom Ma'amtsei Kocham, Lahavir Kav, Listen to what Rav Ashri writes. Rav Ashri says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. The survivors, and certainly their children, are going to think that the best thing to do, lahavir kav. Lahavir kav literally means what? To draw a line. To draw a line. Here's the line that distinguishes between past and then present future. We have to let the past be the past. 
Let's let the past be the past. He says, People don't want to think about what happened 20 years ago. People will want to forget because they're going to say, What is the point of schlepping along all of this baggage? Right? What are you going to do? You're going to harbor animosity against the Germans for the rest of your life. Now, Rav Ashri has some pretty choice words for the Germans, as well as for Jews who buy German products, um, which is which is an interesting an interesting piece as well. But we don't have to get into all of that. But here, Rav Ashri says something amazing. He says people think that in order to move forward, they have to forget. In order to move forward, they have to forget. And, and now, by the way, there's, there's, there's a logic in that, right? There's a logic. Ravashi says, listen, we all have baggage, and we know that one of the most important steps in, in moving forward in life is check your baggage. You, you can't schlep around every single... There are people, right? There are people in this world who they could tell you every single wrong that has been visited upon them. They could tell you. They could tell you in chronological order, in alphabetical order. They could rank the slights from most severe to less severe. They could tell it to you backwards, forwards, male, female, relatives, unrelated, third cousins. They could tell you everything. And most times people like that, they just sit and they stew in it. They just stew in it. They just, they're, they're miserable, miserable people. And so there's definitely a concept of going ahead and sometimes just letting go. But Vashri said there are other things in life from which you can never let go. There are certain things in life that you must take with you each and every day for the rest of your life. So listen to how Rav Ashri interprets it. We're going to do the rest outside, but I urge you to take a look at this piece inside in, when you have a few minutes. So Rav Ashri says like this. First part of Kalish Baruch says, Zohar is asher asar lecham Remember, Remember what Amalek did to you, okay? Well, we'll make it contemporary in just a moment. Remember what Amalek did to you. And then, Klish Baruch Hu says, You see, in the immediate aftermath of your battle with Amalek, of course you're going to remember. But then what happens? Time goes on, and you're going to rebuild, and the wounds heal, and you're going to move your life forward, and you're going to think that in order to move your life forward, you must forget the pain. You must forget. You're going to think. And by the way, it, it actually sounds like a logical argument because it is correct in certain circumstances. You're going to think that in order to move forward, you have to forget the pain. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes along and he says in that moment, Lo tishkach. Do not forget. They're not redundant. They're referring to two different stages in the development of the human condition. Zachar is in the immediate aftermath of your encounter with Amalek, where of course you're going to remember. But then the second part of the, of the commandment is, V'haya v'aniya Hashem alokecha, when Hashem allows your life to once again be good. And you think now that in order to fully self-actualize, you have to let go of everything? Forget everything? No. Not true. Not true. Lo tishkach. Hold on to the pain. Now you ask yourself, why, why hold on to the pain? And by the way, I just want to point out that, that Rav Ashri's words, just from, like a, from a Holocaust perspective, you know, a number of years ago, I heard a term that I found so incredibly offensive. The term was that people suffer from Holocaust fatigue. Holocaust fatigue What's Holocaust? At least I thought when I heard it, what does it mean? Like you're tired from undergoing the Holocaust? Is that is the, is that what it means? No, Holocaust fatigue is like we just talk about it too much. It can't always be about the six million. It can't always be. Now, I'll agree. Judaism can't. You know the mantra of of don't forget, right? Or remember that the, the, the Holocaust can't be your Yiddishkeit, but six million Jews perished less than a century ago. We remember the Chorban Beis HaMikdash from over 2,000 years ago. So what is, what is Rav Ashri saying? What, what, what is he trying to tell us? Because again, remember, I think over the course of our Shi'urim together, if, you know, I, I, sometimes I reflect a little bit and I realize that my wife often tells me that, that she says, you always talk about the same thing. And I've come to realize that, okay, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but I, I think I probably always talk about the same four things. 
Because the truth is, there's like two or three or four, maybe five, core central themes in Yiddishkeit that are necessary for successful living. And I realized, actually, once I accepted it, at first I was a little offended. Then once I accepted it, I'm like, it's very liberating. Because then if I feel I'm being redundant, yeah, I am being redundant. Because the most important lessons in life are not some chiddish, right? It's not like somebody goes ahead and discovers the secret to meaningful living. No one ever knew it before, and some guy or some woman discovers it. There's no more discovery. We all know what you need in order to live successfully. Just sometimes we don't want to do it, or sometimes we don't want to learn it. But there's no chidushim. So what is it? So here we spoke about, if I go back and look, so many times we've spoken about let go, let go, let go. Let go. You can't schlep all of the baggage with you through life because if you do, you become a miserable person. You can't move forward. But here if Ashri is saying, Bring your baggage. But I think Rabbi Ashri is actually saying something a little bit different. I think Rabbi Ashri is saying, own your pain. Own your pain. We spend so much time trying to forget our pain. Right? Someone has a painful circumstance, so, our, so we often say, okay, you have to go for therapy like to get past it, to go that, or medication to get past it. Now, therapy is incredible if, if it could be helpful, and medication is a bracha from the Ribbon Shalom if it's able to help with something specific. But sometimes we approach painful circumstances. You know, I, I often speak with people who have, who have suffered loss, and the question they often ask me is, you know, when is the pain? going to stop? When is the pain going to stop? So, you know, the first thing I often answer is, you know, I, I, Baruch Hashem, in, in my life, I've suffered loss, but never tragic loss. So I, 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 I can't tell you. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But I think you have to change the way you talk. The pain never stops. The pain just changes. I'll, I'll give you an example. Can you imagine, Rahman al a person loses a child. Can you imagine a person says to that bereaved parent, you know, you really have to forget about your child so that you can move on. You say to yourself, oh, 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 of course, no. I can never forget my child, and it's not my job to forget my child. I have to figure out how to own that pain and move with it. That pain is always going to be a part of me. It never goes away. My child is my child. If they're here with me in this world, or if they're in with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that child is always a part of my life. And there'll be no life cycle event that I don't think about, and there'll never be a birthday that I never think about, and everything in life that happens, that child is always going to occupy a place in my neshama. We would never tell a parent, for, you know, in order for you to move on, you have to forget. No. I have to own that pain and take it with me. So amazingly enough, Rav Ashri is saying, the goal is not to forget. The goal is to own your pain. We spend so much time trying to remove pain, trying to obliterate pain, trying to make pain like it doesn't exist. And Rav Ashri says, own it. Own it. Make the pain yours. The pain doesn't own you. You own the pain. The pain is part of your life. And for many times, it becomes a fixture. It's going to be there forever. But I could manage it, I could sculpt it, I could shape it, and I could decide where to put it. So if Ashi says, that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is teaching us. Lo tishkach means, don't spend your life trying to forget your pain. And by the way, this is all kinds of pain, because we all have pain. We all have pain. Yes, some of us have pain of loss, of loss, because we've lost people who we love, whether it was, you know, People like to, in the world of loss, people like to kind of, you know, bifurcate. There's tragic loss and quote-unquote normal loss. And that, that's not necessarily fair. A person might lose a parent who's 100 years old. That could still be a traumatic loss for a person because that parent was there for me during some very difficult times. That parent represents, it could be, so we all suffer from, we, we all have loss in different ways. My goal is own it own it. And by the way, the loss is sometimes the loss of a loved one. Sometimes there's another kind of pain. Sometimes there are things, you know, I had dreams. There are things I wanted to do in life. Or there are opportunities that I wanted to take that for some reason I didn't. And that pain sits on my soul because I think about what my life could have been like. I think about who I could have been. So what do you do with that? What do you do with that? So yes, sometimes you just have to offload it. Sometimes you have to draw that line. But very often in life, the goal is own your pain. 
Don't let your pain own you. You own your pain. Shape it, sculpt it, and decide how it is going to make you a stronger, more resilient, more responsible, and more successful person. Any person who lives with loss will tell you that they look at the world through a different set of eyes. Through a different set of eyes. Every, every simcha is magnified tenfold. And every little thing is a bracha. When, you, when, you've, when you've faced loss and you live with loss, you take nothing for granted. Nothing. Because you realize how fragile life is and how everything could change in a moment. And suddenly, every bracha becomes amplified. And the sun is even brighter. And the sky is even bluer. Because nothing is for granted. Every bracha. You know how powerful that is? When you own your loss, when you own your pain, you can own that pain to inform everything else in your life and you become stronger. You become better. Of course, no one wants pain. No one wants it. I don't believe anyone has ever signed up on the divine Google Doc that says, sign me up for loss. Sign me up for adversity. Sign me up for, okay, but we know we don't get to, cha- we don't get to change that. We don't get to choose that. That's not our choice. Our circumstances of life are of- often visited upon us. The only choice we have is how we manage those circumstances. So if Ashri says, we spend so much mental energy trying to obliterate pain, trying to erase pain, trying to cancel pain, Instead of saying, this is it, this, this is what I've got, this is the pain, but I'm not going to let it. You know, pain could be a tidal wave of darkness that overtakes you and shuts everything out. I'm not going to let that happen. I won't drown in my pain, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to own it. This is my life. These are my circumstances. This is the pain. How could I shape it in a way to make me stronger? I'll give you a simple example of this. If you think about this, just a moment, right? So how do we? So we have the pain of being attacked from Amalek, right? So remember again, we just came off two hundred and ten years of being victimized, right? As, as people, so here now Amalek attacks us. Who says, "Don't forget." You ever wonder to yourself, like, what is our mitzvah? Of, uh, I remember Amalek. Okay, so I remember people hate us. I don't really need a reminder of that, right? I'm pretty pretty acutely aware of that day in and day out that there are people who don't like us. So, for example, if you own your pain, you begin to see, who did Amalek attack? Who did Amalek attack? Amalek attacked the Nechashala Macharecha. They attacked the stragglers. The stragglers. Shame on us that there were stragglers. Shame on us that there were people tarrying by. How, how did we forget about the elderly? How did we forget about the sick? How did we forget about the people who couldn't keep up? You know what happened? All we were doing was looking at ourselves and our friends. Oh, the, the kids are here? The kids are here? Right? My friends are here? Everybody's here? Good. Okay, if, 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 if we're okay, then everybody else must be okay. No one thought about the guy in the back of the line. And no one thought about the woman with the walker. And no one thought about the mother with a bunch of young children who was all alone and couldn't keep up with anyone else. We forgot about the stragglers. And because we forgot about the stragglers, so Amalek came. See, if you own your pain, you learn, you learn from it. If you own your pain, you grow from it. And perhaps this, see, looping all the way back, David HaMelech says, La da'as ba'aretz darkecha. That in life, there are things you have to know. There are things you have to know in order to be a successful human being. If, if you don't know it, if you don't know it, you're just simply not going to be successful. And perhaps one of the things I have to know in life is this week's parasha, parasha Zachar. I have to know Zachar and Lotishkach. Yes, I have to remember the painful experiences of life, but I also have to avoid the erroneous mindset that says, in order to be successful, I have to forget, eradicate, cancel my pain. That's not true. Vahaya bahaniach. You don't have to draw a line between yourself and your pain in order to be successful. You just have to own your pain instead of letting it own you. We have to take our traumatic and sometimes tragic circumstances in life and not allow them, as I mentioned before, to become that tidal wave of darkness that overtakes us and drowns us. Instead, I have to say, this is my pain. It's going to be with me forever. Or, or if not forever, certainly for a long time. How do I use it? How do I use it? How do I turn it from a handicap, ultimately again, into a source of incredible strength? 
How do I take the pain of past failures and past strategies and use it to go out and somehow become a stronger and better person? That, and this is what Rabbi Ashri is writing just a few years after the war. This is his message to the survivors, and the survivors did it. The survivors did it. The proof to that is we're here today, and we are thriving. And we are thriving not in spite of the Holocaust, not in spite of their pain, but because you had embers saved from the fire who decided, you know what? We saw how everything could be lost. We're now going to redouble our efforts to build something that will endure Amir Hashem until Mashiach. That's what they did, and therefore we're here. And that's what we must do as well. So as we read Parsha Zohar, let the words of David HaMelech, Ladaz Ba'aretz Ta'kecha, to think about in life, what are the things I have to know, and what are the things that are nice to know? The thing I have to know is don't let your pain own you. You own your pain. You shape your narrative. You decide how that ball of pain that sometimes sits inside of my soul won't debilitate or handicap me, but instead will become a source of growth, a source of inspiration, and I will use that pain as the catalyst to accomplish something great. We'll stop over here for today, Amir Hashem. We will continue next week. Um, I think Amir Hashem will do, well, be Tehillim. Maybe we'll do something related to Purim and Tehillim as well. It's for sure not going to be Kapitel Samech Zayin. That's the one thing I can tell you. For sure, it will not be Chapter 67. What it'll be, Amir Hashem, the journey will continue. Wishing everyone, and thank you again to Mrs. Shulman for working so hard to facilitate all of this. And uh, wishing everyone a wonderful day. Thank you, Rabbi. Of course. Of course.